today. The, both the, the co-authors uh, of the bill are with us, Senator Gary Winfield, um, who is also co-chair of the Judiciary Committee uh, out of New Haven. We have Representative Steve Stastrom, who is the co-chair of the Judiciary Committee um, as well, with Senator Winfield out of Bridgeport. Uh, with us tonight as well is uh, Mike Lawler, uh, former prosecutor, former, former state representative, and co-chair of the Judiciary Committee in the past, and the former Undersecretary for Criminal Justice under Governor Malloy, who is currently a professor at University of New Haven. And tonight we will also speak uh, uh, briefly with Police Chief Keith Mello, who is from the police, uh, the Milford Police Department, uh, happens to be the, the past president of the, of the South Central Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, but is here with us tonight in his personal capacity. Um, I also wanted to note that, you know, Connect is a nonpartisan organization. We do our best to provide a platform uh, where we can have, uh, you know, nonpartisan or bipartisan discussions. We did reach out uh, to Senator George Logan, uh, who did seem interested in joining us tonight, uh, but unfortunately had a conflict because he's participating in a debate uh, tonight for his seat in the upcoming election. We also reached out to Senator Kevin Kelly, who's a senior Republican um, member of the legislature. Uh, we invited him numerous times in an effort, uh, as I mentioned, to have a bipartisan platform tonight. Unfortunately, we, re we received no response um, and there was no suggestion for someone else to, to come and speak in their place. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately that, that did not happen. Um, but you know, not, nonetheless, um, we're gonna take everybody's questions and try to, to answer them as best that we can. Um, I wanted to congratulate everybody on joining us tonight. We're actually now at 134 uh, participants. And so for just a moment, we're gonna unmute all of you. Uh, I'd like you to just give a brief uh, applause for our guests and for yourselves for turning out tonight. Uh, so thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we really do appreciate all. Oh, I was on mute for just a second there. Uh, so for, for just a couple of minutes, we're going to give you uh, a brief rundown. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be filled with information, and I apologize, but there's a lot to go over. Um, we're going to give you a rundown of what is in the new law, and, and it should give you a sense of what's not in the new law as well. So what exactly does the Act Concerning Police Accountability mean uh, for Connecticut residents and police? Let's get into that. The first thing I want to tell you about is that there's a section on decertifying officers. There's, there's the police officer standards and training or post counsel. They can suspend or revoke a police officer certification if that officer discriminates or falsifies reports or uses excessive force. Um, they do, you know, they would have an opportunity to, to reapply for reinstatement after two years. Um, and there's an opportunity to appeal those types of suspensions or revocations. Also, the bill includes training. Police officers will be required to participate uh, in additional training on top of what they've already been uh, you know, required to do, uh, specifically aimed at, at implicit bias training. In addition, with some limited exceptions, all local police must now use body cameras and most must use dashboard cams in their vehicles. Police officers also are gonna be required to receive a mental health assessment at least once every five years. And there's a large section in the bill on, on, on what those requirements are. As you know, uh, police uh, you know, enter into collective bargaining agreements um, and therefore, you know, in the past, the state legislature approved an agreement with the state police union that could block certain freedom of information requests, including, uh, you know, unsubstantiated internal investigations. This bill undoes that disclosure protection. So now collective bargaining agreements can no longer prohibit the disclosure of disciplinary actions against police officers. 
we're going to get into what qualified immunity is, um, but uh, th and there's a lot of talk about this part of the bill. Um, but what this legislation does is it doesn't get rid of qualified immunity, but it does place a limit so that it no longer applies in cases that involve what they call malicious, wanton, or willful acts, or acts that demonstrate reckless disregard on the part of an officer. Police officers will still have immunity so long as they had an objectively good faith belief that their conduct was not violating the law. In addition, the bill prohibits law enforcement agencies now from acquiring certain military equipment. There's a lot of, of uh, different types of equipment that are now prohibited from, from being purchased. And the state, once, once that the equipment that they currently have is inventory, they'll report that to the state, and then the state can order those agencies to sell, transfer, or otherwise dispose of any of that military equipment already possessed um, by the agencies, although they can ask for an exemption from that type of an order. There are other uh, things that have changed. Under the previous law, the police could use deadly force if they reasonably believed that it was necessary to defend themselves or others from the use uh, of imminent or the imminent use of deadly force. This bill now requires officers' actions to be objectively reasonable given the circumstances, such as whether a person was in possession or appeared to be in possession of a deadly weapon. Officers are now also required to engage in reasonable de-escalation measures before using deadly physical force. Uh, and therefore, that type of force is no longer justified when an officer's own actions led to increased risk by escalating a situation and thus prompting the use of deadly force. In addition, both police officers and corrections officers have a duty under the law that's specified in the, in the new bill to intervene if another officer is using unjustified deadly force and the post council regulations already require that, but this new law now codifies it into the state statute and also raises the possibility of criminal penalties. A witnessing officer therefore must report the incident as soon as practical. In addition, although a number of towns may have already had civilian review boards, Towns now are empowered under this statute to establish their own civilian review boards by ordinance. Um, those boards will act as an external investigative authority for police conduct, and they will have subpoena powers that are required under the statute. And in our view, um, you know, local organizing around this issue is needed uh, you know, in your town if you want to get that implemented. The bill also encourages local police departments to evaluate the feasibility of now partnering with social workers when answering certain types of calls. In addition, law enforcement agencies now have to submit use of force data annually in standardized methods so that the state can easily compile statistics. Those reports will also include race and gender uh, of the person upon whom force was used the number of times force was used, and any injuries sustained by those persons. The bill also creates an Office of Inspector General, which will be housed within the state's Division of Criminal Justice that will have the, the power and the duty to investigate police officers' use of force cases and to prosecute any cases where force wasn't justified, as well as cases involving the failure of officers to intervene when, when that type of force was unjustified. As to civilians, the bill raises the penalty, um, <laughs> there we go, raises the penalty for falsely reporting an incident uh, specifically due to a person's race, religion, ethnicity, disability, sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And it would also increase the penalty for a civilian misusing the 911 call system based on bigotry or bias, um, from being a class B misdemeanor to now a class A misdemeanor, which is the highest misdemeanor that, that you know, the state has. In addition, a law enforcement officer cannot conduct a search of a motor vehicle under this bill or its contents 
without probable cause when the vehicle has been stopped solely for a motor vehicle violation. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we've, we've reached the, the end of our rundown. What I'd like to do now um, is to go back and, and reintroduce us to uh, Chief Keith Mello. As I mentioned before, he's the chief of the Milford Police Department. He is the past president of the South Central Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, but he's here tonight speaking uh, only from his, on, you know, in his personal capacity. He's someone that we've known and respected um, and, and obviously still respect. We're happy to have him here to share his views with us. And we are hopeful that he can stay as long as he can tonight, but I understand that he may not be able to stay for the entire event. Um, and so with that, I'd, I'd like to just turn it over to Chief Mello. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, and good evening, everyone. And I, I see uh, there's some names uh, in the, in the uh, participants that I recognize. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, hello to, uh, and good evening to uh, Senator Winfield and Representative Stastrom. I see Mike Lawler there as well. So uh, there are some familiar faces uh, and some, I'm sure others as well. If we were in a room, I would probably recognize more of you, but it's tough on this little thumbnail screen. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I just wanted to uh, um, uh, reinforce what, uh, what Phil had said earlier. I'm the past president of the Connecticut uh, Chiefs of Police Association and that uh, my term ended in, uh, on J uh, June 30th. Uh, I'm the current chairman of the uh, Police Officer Standards and Training Council. Um, but I hear, I'm here speaking in my own capacity uh, tonight. And um, so I, I just, it's important that I am not authorized to speak for the chiefs. Um, but I, I, and so I, I really didn't want to uh, speak that much about the bill um, specifically and some of the provisions. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions, um, but I'd like to move on past that. Uh, I mean, it is certainly no secret, and we have a number of folks on here who have, I'm sure have heard from law enforcement or know law, law enforcement officers. And, and yes, this, this bill uh, is uh, extremely unpopular uh, with police officers uh, and uh, many police chiefs. And there is a lot of, there's a lot of emotion around the bill. And I think that's starting to dissipate, at least some of the emotion. And so, um, I think what's important and what I've spent a lot of my time doing and part of the reason that I'm here is to uh, um, understand the provisions of the bill and prepare my, my officers, which I believe are, have been prepared even before this bill passed, um, but also prepare officers throughout the state. And that is through developing policies and, and guidelines for implementation of this bill. And, uh, and I think it's important to also note that while many police officers, and let me just reference police chiefs, the police chiefs that, that I know, that while there's opposition to um, some of what's in the bill, it doesn't mean there's opposition to um, for change or improvements in policing because uh, I, it would be uh, wrong in my view, uh, and I would disagree with anyone in, in this, this business that uh, believes that policing doesn't need to change, it doesn't need to evolve. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. And, especially with governmental organizations that historically are resistant to change, uh, we certainly need to change and we certainly need to evolve. And if we haven't realized that by what we've seen around the country, um, then we're not seeing um, the clear picture. So uh, um, instead of talking about the bill tonight, uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about um, a few things that we are doing um, that uh, certainly uh, uh, are in line with the bill but I, I would also like to, uh, to, um, to remind all of you that our legislators aren't the only ones that get to uh, work on improving policing. And, uh, and so there is more commonality uh, than you might think. And so when I think when folks talk about disagreements and debate, I'd like to think that that's healthy um, because perspectives are different, but there is more commonality than you could probably imagine. And, and I mentioned that just a, a minute ago when I talked about I believe that my department was well situated for many of the changes because um, in many of the changes in the bill we had implemented uh, already. Uh, I also think it's important that uh, we focus on not just um, creating statute and, and creating statutory language and, and think that that is going to um, be as transformative as, um, as it needs to be because I don't believe that's the case. I believe when it comes down to, it comes down to leadership and it comes down to understanding that human interaction and working to find ways to improve the interaction 
between human beings. And the challenge, there, there, there's a significant challenge, I believe, that when you're talking about interactions between groups of people that um, haven't shared the same experience, um, and especially when you're dealing with police officers who um, have little understanding uh, what it's like to have the experiences of growing up and living in a fragile community, in our most challenged communities. And I think that what's happened with the, uh, the murder of George Floyd is transformative in itself, because I think it's, it's uh, as we see our, our, our families and our neighbors and our friends, for the first time showing up on greens and at protests and, and demanding change, uh, I think that in itself was transformative and it resonated with so many. So just a, a couple things that uh, I just would like uh, to highlight. Uh, the Police Officers and Standards and Training Council in the last two years has made such significant changes in, uh, in, in, in policy and in training. And I, and I realized that as I started to look at the language that was in our police accountability bill. And I follow around the country and I look at the different systems around the country and I look at some of the debate and some of their proposals and some of, uh, um, you know, what was enacted and what was passed and what wasn't passed, both in cities and in states. A lot of what they're talking about in other states and other cities are things that have already happened here in Connecticut and happened years ago. And that's a credit to uh, our legislature, but it's also a credit to our police chiefs and our post council. Um, and so much of what, uh, Phil, you talked about tonight, uh, when we talk about body cameras, uh, most everyone should have had body cameras by now. It's, it's, I find it hard to believe that uh, departments uh, don't, but they will, and uh, that's a good thing. And body cameras are good for everyone, for police officers, uh, for the citizens. It makes good evidence. I think it helps uh, um, enhance the confidence that the public has because they know there's a record we talked about implicit bias training. We have been teaching implicit bias training for many years. Um, in fact, the post council has just created a new program called the social justice seminar that every police officer and every police recruit will uh, participate in a three day social justice seminar. So while implicit bias was in the, in the bill, we have always thought implicit bias, it was under a different title, fair and impartial policing, but we've now enhanced that. Um, and we've had, we've logically grouped all those subjects together to make it, uh, to present it and what we believe in a more meaningful way. I think it's also important that uh, the folks that are on this call um, know that Connecticut um, training, the core recruit training program has been evaluated um, and uh, it is one of the top programs in terms of hours and content in the entire nation. Um, I think that Connecticut prior to the police accountability bill was a leader um, and I think they remain a leader. Um, and so as we focus on uh, what's in this police accountability bill and we prepare for the implementation, which is gradual over time, and, and, and we're grateful that the legislature saw fit to do that because it, these are um, a change in the way we do business. And, and so we certainly need to prepare for that. So both, yes, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Chief Mallow. I just wanted to, um, uh, to, to jump in real briefly. The, and then I think we have to, to, to to make some room for, for sure, Senator absolutely. Winter and Representative absolutely. Staffsham. But I did want to ask you, you know, I appreciate where you're coming from on this, um, but I, you know, with some of the, you know, some of what you said about leadership, um, I think that that's really important. Uh, I think that the culture of the departments is really important. And I guess what I would ask is, you know, with some of the things that we've seen in, in, in Norwalk and Bridgeport since the bill passed, um, what would you what would you suggest you know in terms of of police officers you know and their relationship with the community is there is there anything you would suggest to, in, in light of the conduct so you know some of the conduct by a few that we've seen or the type of leadership you you think we ought to see around this bill phil I, I, and, and so the, the point i was going to make and, and uh, um i, I think hope it, i hope it's responsive to your question is uh, you can't legislate your way um, to, you know, and expect these uh, improvements uh, or expect this to be as transformative uh, as it needs to be. And it takes leadership. What I mean by leadership is um, 
we need to change the way we make our decisions, right? And so we need to be conscious of uh, what those decisions are and, and, and what that decision-making model is. And especially when we're talking about interaction, especially when we're talking about use of force. Um, and so that requires leadership at the local level. And it's not just the training hours and the training content, it's the value of that training. You know, how good is that training? Um, and, and that has to be done at the training level, at the local level. It doesn't show up in a piece of paper. It doesn't show up in a policy. It doesn't show up in a statute, which helps with accountability, certainly. But we can't just keep removing police officers and then finding new ones. We've got to better prepare them to make better decisions. And I think it starts with an understanding. And I, and, and, and I, I go back to what I said just a minute ago, and that is, I think we are in this seminal period of time um, where, where police officers who um, will insist that they share no bias and that they, the bias does not creep into the decisions, they're asking themselves, well, wait a minute, um, it has to. There's got to be that unconscious decision-making process, that, in, that, that unconscious bias as because our, and I'm going to say R is law enforcement. I know some don't like to uh, judge trying to get law enforcement outside our borders, but I think it's foolish not to. Um, and so I think when we start to look at that and we think, okay, do I really understand the experience of, the, of everyone that I interact with? I think the answer to that is no. And I think people are starting to realize that. And so when I talk about leadership, um, you know, you, you can't just say, uh, and I know there's been proposals, spend some time in, in, a, in an area uh, that is unlike the one that you police. No, it's the value of that of that interaction, right? What are you going to get out of it? It's not just the hours. It's got to be something that is, I think, a significant emotional event. And I think training, if it's done the right way, can do that. Um, and uh, and that's what we're trying to do with uh, our work at the Post Council and our work with policy and our work uh, with training programs and closely aligning those two. Um, and I think that that's where the change uh, can be most effective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your comments tonight. I do hope you'll be able to stick around uh, for some of the Q&A, which is going to come up soon. Uh, and, and, you know, I know people are going to have a lot of questions. We're, we're running a little bit behind. Uh, so I want to turn it over to Asti, who's going to uh, introduce, uh, reintroduce Senator Winfield and Representative Stastrom with us. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Mello. So we wanted to uh, just transition before we get to our Q and A. Just uh, ask a question from uh, Representative Stapstrom and Senator Winfield, just to uh, kind of start our Q and A, and it's specifically about the bill. Um, and so to answer Winfield, um, why is the bill personally important for you? Well, good evening, and you may hear my child in the background. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna have to be um the the bill is uh important to me um as an individual because uh i think a lot of what we were attempting to do uh spoke uh not only to work i've been doing as a senator and representative and before that uh community member who was active in the community but as a as a, as a person as a black person and um it it spoke to a lot of the the issues that I had seen uh, in my community and beyond over the years in terms of the relationship between police uh, and that community. Um, and uh, many of you know that we've done uh, several iterations on this thing. Um, and in this moment when the country, when people who never protested about anything uh, were active, uh, I thought that a state like Connecticut that has been a leader as the chief suggested that has been a leader should step up and do the right thing. So uh, that's why this bill was of particular importance to me. Thank you so much, Senator Winfield. And now I'm gonna ask the same question to Representative Stashram. Why was this bill important for you? So Asti, I think, I think the key was responding to the call for change that we heard loud and clear throughout our state, um, both in our urban communities like mine and Senator Winfield's in, in Bridgeport, New Haven, respectively, but also in, you know, small towns around the state, um, you know, responding not just to the uh, murder of Mr. Floyd and Brown and Taylor, but also, um, you know, the Jason the Ground shooting and, and the other names, the other 20 names that were listed as we started this program. Um, 
you know, which I think kind of brings me not to get ahead, but but to some of the criticism we've heard of this, which is that um, maybe police weren't at the table. And and I, you know, I fundamentally reject that. I, you know, we had Senator Winfield and I had multiple discussions with um, leadership of the police unions and the state police, uh, the police chiefs association. But being at the table doesn't mean you have the pen in your hand. Um, and I think that's the key, that's the key difference and distinction on why this bill was important is because this bill was about uh, sort of the degree of oversight and control with respect to how we police communities and not just those that are doing it right. And, and quite frankly, I'm glad Chief Mello was joining us tonight because in my mind, he's one of the best, if not the best and, and gets this and, and has been a great partner of ours. Um, on a number of issues, but unfortunately, not every department has a chief mellow to um, to it. Um, and so, I think it's about returning some level of civilian oversight, uh, civilian control, um, and making sure that something like policing is now not a, not a self-regulating um, uh, profession. Uh, it's a difficult profession to be sure, and, and, and certainly one that we should be absolutely, absolutely 100% um, thankful for those who uh, put their lives on the line to do it every day. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility. And, and that's, uh, I think, why this bill was so important is to make sure that we, we were setting uh, those boundaries and those frameworks, not just for one department, but for every department around the state. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Representative Stafford. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I know since uh, uh, Professor Lawler is, is also here with us, I just, uh, and as questions start to hopefully uh, roll in in the chat, um, uh, you know, people, if you have questions, please start putting them in the chat and we'll, we will start getting to them. But I wanted to ask Professor Lawler, um, what do you see, uh, you know, in terms of this bill, uh, how, do you, how do you view the importance of the bill? Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. It's an honor to be here with uh, my former colleagues and with Chief Mello, and I've known them all for a long time. But uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the legislation that was enacted this summer, at least in my opinion, is really the beginning of a discussion. Um, <clears throat> what's clear, there, there's gonna be some minor adjustments made in what was passed in the summer, right? There's been some technical issues that have been identified. I'm sure that's gonna happen. But also I think there's more to come. And I think a lot of this has to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a lot of this has to depend on the election outcome. And I don't mean that in a partisan way. I just mean, once we get beyond this hyper-partisan election battle that's going on, I think then you'll begin to get a sense of the, the, the dimensions of the reforms that we're going to see over the next year, two, three years, not just in Connecticut, but throughout the nation and at the, in the United States Congress. And uh, if the past is any guide, uh, there will be a significant, you know, again, depending on the election outcome, uh, there will be a significant impetus coming from Washington in the form of both grants and uh, conditions set on those grants to implement a lot of the same reforms that, as Chief Mello said, Connecticut's always kind of been at the forefront of this stuff to start with. And I think it's a great opportunity for all of us who care about reducing crime, and, 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 and building confidence in law enforcement and the criminal justice system generally, promoting the relationships that, that have the effects we wanna have. The next year, and in particular the next six months are gonna be crucial to getting it right. And, and we all have a unique opportunity uh, to make that happen. So that's what I see happening and um, I'm happy to be part of it in Connecticut. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I wanted to raise up in, in the chat, uh, and there's a question that, that we have, um, and this can, this can go, I think, to, you know, maybe we'll, we'll just see who would like to respond first. The first question we have is, how can we promote ongoing conversations between police departments and communities about this bill and about public safety in general? Um, and I, I guess uh, maybe I'd go just go back to you, Professor Lawler, first, if you want to jump in on that, and then we can turn to 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 the others if they'd like to speak. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I was actually reading in the chat. I didn't exactly <laughs> hear your question. I apologize. What was it again? 
That's okay. Um, let me let me scroll back so I can find it. The question is, how can we promote uh, ongoing conversations between police departments and communities about the bill and about public safety in general? And that's from oh. Paul, Paul Hammer. So I think step one is get this election behind us because I think people, I mean, the, the well, I mean, I don't have to explain it to you. I mean, you can see what's happening. I think it's gonna be a lot easier to have those discussions after the election's over. People kind of know where things stand at that point. And, and, I, and, and I think Chief Mello is quite right. There are so many law enforcement professionals that welcome this opportunity to, to improve things. And um, I think those people who, are, who wanna participate in good faith from the law enforcement side and from the community activist side, uh, we'll have the opportunity to do that. And, and I know, you know, Steve and Gary can speak for themselves, but I mean, it was pretty, uh, from what I could tell from the outside, there was a lot of discussion that went on before that bill was enacted in August. And it sounded like it, many of the stakeholders were direct participants, including Democrats and Republicans and their leadership at the Capitol. So my, my sense is that's gonna continue. But at the end of the day, you know, I think we have some models in our state. You know, I live in New Haven. I think compared to other places in the state, the New Haven Police Department gets it. They do a really good job. Definitely not perfect. There's a lot that needs to be improved. But, uh, and then we have other places in the state, which I won't name, that are still with the old school. And um, I think it's going to be harder for them to move forward than some of the more progressive police departments. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think it's important for everyone to be respectful and open-minded as, as we move through this process. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Winfield, what, what would you say about that question about how do we get this, this discussion you know, going in a, in a productive way? Yeah, I, I think that uh, Mike largely hit it on the head. Um, I, I will say that uh, for my part, both with this bill and, and any of the bills I've been associated with, I have uh, signaled a willingness to, to have these conversations. <laughs> I've said so in the press and uh, in every meeting that we've had. I think, unfortunately, there has been uh, some level of reticence to, to engage. And I think that the bad part about that is that uh, while we are having conversations with uh, some people who represent police, be it the unions or uh, some of the leadership, uh, others just don't actually understand that they can be part of the conversation. And so, um, you know, I think the election is, is um, a big thing out there. Uh, that kind of has some impact on this. And uh, you know what the national conversation is about law and order. But I think once we get past that, um, the efforts that we're making to uh, engage uh, people in the law enforcement community uh, might uh, see people recognize that this is not something that's going away. We've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, we intend to continue to work on this until uh, you know, until we, we feel that we've made enough progress. And so it, it's beneficial to them to actually be a part of the conversation. Um, it, it only informs us for the better. Bill, can I add to that if you don't mind? Sure, please go ahead. So um, and to, uh, to Michael Waller's point, and I've also noticed <clears throat> some questions in the chat and then talk about the differences in culture and differences in in uh, systems, and, and I mean systems by different law enforcement agencies. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the areas that we've uh, worked hard to address with the Post Council, and that is there is a mandatory uh, or course set of curriculum that every police officer goes through, and we <clears> work <throat> hard to develop uh, mandated policies. We're working on a use of force policy. We've been working several months. We have some national uh, uh, folks on, on that committee, um, and so. Connecticut is one of the few states that operates under one single policy when it comes to use of force and how to make those decisions. And so uh, we have, and, and if you look at uh, the policies of the Post Council, you look at the legislation, uh, most of what we're doing is trying to get the all 100 and plus municipalities and law enforcement agencies on the same page and to make sure that we have, you know, we have a, a, a program called CLESS, which is a set of proven and reliable standards. Uh, we audit those police departments to make sure that uh, they all are not only have these policies, but these policies are in practice. You'll see in this bill, and you talked about it, that there's a mandatory accreditation standard. Now, whether CLIA is the way to go or tier three is the way to go is something that technically we can discuss, but uh, we are moving forward. We have been and will continue to move forward to try to develop some consistency in, uh, in you know, the application of these, uh, these policies. 
Thank you so much for answering, uh, Chief Mello. We really appreciate it. So we have another question in the chat. Uh, it says, I have a neighbor who was a police officer in Bridgeport and told me a year ago that the knowledge that there are so many guns on the streets gives you a shoot or be shot fear. Can de-escalation training or any other training make a difference in this attitude? And Chief Mello, if you don't mind, you think you can answer that question? Sure. I'm going to um, stay away from um, the, the guns on the street because I, I tend to get myself in trouble whenever I speak about, uh, ask the question of why there are so many guns on the street. And uh, I know Matt knows um, what I'm referring to. Uh, so, but I will focus on de-escalation training. Now, de-escalation training is, is, it should be part of every police training program. It has always been a part of, well, excuse me, over the last three years, it's been a part of the recruit curriculum. One of the things that we're really focusing on is de-escalation training mandated for every police department, part of every policy, and part of that operational standard, part of that decision-making process, and uh, uh, when someone makes a use of force decision. We believe, uh, and there's where we may disagree with our, our legislators, that it belongs more in policy than it does in in the law because it needs to be defined and it needs and it needs to be accompanied by a by a training piece. But de-escalation, um, it's difficult for me to get, to answer your question because every situation is different and de-escalation is is always the desired outcome. It is a tactic. It is something that we uh, we need to spend more time on. Um, and we need to look at force, and we have been doing this, at least in Milford PD, and we are now doing this with the state, that the use of force is actually a failure, right? We have to say that the success is the avoidance of force. Now, we know that force is sometimes unavoidable, and that has to be recognized, especially, you know, I have 39 years experience. I know that sometimes force is unavoidable, and it's always ugly, but it should, it, it always has to be a last resort, um, and, uh, and, and so that is, that's our focus. But uh, to answer your question regarding uh, the number of guns out there, it, it, it all falls back to the mindset of that person of, of what they're going to do with that gun. Or, and do they want to cause harm? And all the de-escalation in the world may not impact that. Uh, Thanks, Chief. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Representative. I, I, yeah, uh, Phil, I just, I just want to, um, just piggyback on that and just make sure um, that we're clear because I've seen some of the questions and comments in the chat as well. And, you know, I'll say what um, I know Senator Winfield and I have said before uh, to Chief, Chief Mello, um, you know, the use of force policy in this bill is to me one of the three sections of the bill, uh, three topics in the bill that has probably gotten the most feedback or criticism or, or questions on it. Um, and this is actually one of the instances where in, not only did we change the language uh, from the first draft that was released to the public, um, but actually kicked the effective date out to April as a result of working with Chief Mello. I, I don't think any of us in the legislature are trying to play a game of gotcha and get uh, police to a situation where they're facing criminal charges for using force. That's absolutely no one's intent. Uh, the intent is to help elevate the standard and to work with post and work with police departments to elevate the standard. So, in fact, the changes to the use of force policy don't take effect until next April. Um, and that was actually specifically at the request of, of um, the post council. And, and, you know, we remain committed to working on refining the exact language of uh, the, of the use of force language uh, based on the training models that POST comes out with. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, de-escalation and making sure that officers are not intentionally putting themselves in a situation where they need to use force, like we've seen in Hamden and Weathersfield and elsewhere, um, is got to, it has to be a piece to that. Uh, but the exact language is very much um, uh, still able to be massaged and changed. And, and in fact, so isn't the time for implementation to make sure we're providing the right timing for training um, because that really is the goal at the end of the day is to increase, uh, increase the accountability and the level of uh, policing as opposed to playing some game of gotcha with, with the folks out on the streets. Thank, thank you both for weighing in on that. I, I want to I want to just raise because we've got tons of questions, um, in, and I want to 
you know, that was from Therese Lefevre. I want to move on to a question by Ann Lampert, and I think some others may have asked about this. There's been a story out recently that, that there's a deadlock on the inspector general position. Um, I wondered if you might, uh, you know, Representative Staffstrom be able to tell us about the status of that, um, as well as uh, the funding component for that, and maybe speak to the, the independence that, that's expected from that position as well. Yeah, so let me let me take that backwards. Um, I think the independence piece is a big one. I think there's some folks who say, well, why is it under the Division of Criminal Justice at all? Well, that's because of the Constitution. The Constitution in the state of Connecticut requires that the prosecutorial powers of the uh, state be vested under the Division of Criminal Justice. So you can't have someone who can prosecute crimes and not be in that division. That's why the, um, that's why the Attorney General can't prosecute crimes. Um, so there's really, without a constitutional change, there's nowhere else to put it. Um, in terms of why there's a deadlock, um, I think, uh, I think unfortunately there's, um, there's a little bit of, I would say sort of misunderstanding of the exact language of the bill and who's eligible for that position or who's not eligible. Um, Senator Winfield and I have been working with, uh, the chair of the criminal justice commission, uh, to deal with that. And, um, you know, we want to make sure as, as much as we want somebody in that position sooner than later, we also want to make sure it's the right person in that spot. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Winfield, we have a question from Emily uh, uh, Lehrman that asks whether you, you could just tell us a bit about how this bill will actually help police officers who are doing their jobs properly. Um, so I, I think, I think when, <laughs> I think we have to think of the perception of police, um, in, in certain communities and even beyond those communities. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the response you saw over the summer, uh, forget, forget the history, but if you just look at the response you saw over the summer, uh, you know that, uh, while I think many of our, our officers are doing a, a good job and a job that is dangerous, um, there is a perception about what policing is right now, at least as it responds to certain communities. Um, and I don't think that's good for any of the officers. I don't think it's safe for any of the officers. If you, if you go into a community that's on edge, uh, just seeing, I just don't think that is a safe condition. And so I think, uh, you know, the efforts to uh, get this right uh, to make sure that uh, when things happen, uh, there's recourse for people and all of the things that that follow on from the bill actually uh, change the perception of policing. And I think that's important. I think that has gotten lost mm -hmm. uh, to a degree in this conversation. Um, and, and I think it needs to, to come back into the conversation. Um, and also, I think parts of this that um, we, we just don't think about. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about certain sections of the bill. There's been, uh, you know, little talk about uh, not just this bill, but the 2019 bills have been completely glossed over. Uh, but, you know, the, the mental health component that was in that bill and some of the other elements in this bill have been lost. But those things over the long run, I think, will change not only what it is to, to, to police, but how police are perceived. And I think that is good for uh, people who are out there doing the job that they should be doing. Well said. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So we have a couple more questions. Um, one question comes from Mark Ahrens, who represents the family of Murabak Solomon. Uh, it says, do you believe, and forgive me if I said the name wrong, uh, do you believe the newly established Office of Independent Counsel will actually be independent? And whoever's up to take this question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll go back to what I said before, I guess, uh, is, as long as we find the right person for that job, then absolutely. You know, I think as, as as lawyers, um, we are trained to represent our client and do um, do the job we're hired to do. And, and I think if we hire the right person into that job, um, they'll do the job well. Yeah, if I could jump in, I, I think that that is the intention. Um, I, and I don't think any of us can predict the future. But you know, the, the way that 
uh, we now have an, an office of the inspector general that is supposed to be independent, I think um, is because we have been working on this issue and this is where we, we find ourselves right now. And if it doesn't work out, I think uh, that work doesn't end just because this is what we've done. I think, I think uh, if, if all of the, the players really mean to get this right, then we'll look at, assess what we have put in place and whether it's working or not and, and make the, the, the adjustments that are necessary. Um, and, and one of the things I, I've said to some of the people who were extremely supportive of the work that we've done is that just because we've done it do doesn't mean it's perfect, right? None of the bills that I've ever done have been perfect. None of the implementation has been easy, but the real work is not passing the bill. The real work is doing the implementation and then doing an analysis and figuring out what the next step to make sure you actually get it right is. So I think that's the approach we should be taking here. Thank you, Senator. Um, can I, I'd like to just, this goes a little bit to, to Bert Saxon's question on qualified immunity, but I think what might be important before we get into that specific question is, is if, if, if you could tell us about how the bill um, modifies that doctrine, um, and then maybe get into Bert's question about whether the narrowing of qualified immunity makes it more likely that police departments will then discipline you know, their, their own officers who use excessive force. So I think you will get a, a range of answers uh, on that. And unfortunately, this has become um, probably the most politicized piece of the entire bill, which is unfortunate because I do think there's a lot of rank and file police officers who are walking around thinking that qualified immunity has been eliminated. It has not. Um, I, none of us uh, proponents of the bill. I don't think anybody, um, certainly in the legal community, who's looked at this thinks qualified immunity has been eliminated. If anything, what we have done, um, and some have criticized us for this, quite frankly, particularly on the left, is we have we have um, we have actually codified a qualified immunity doctrine that didn't previously exist into state law um, that didn't exist before. Um, and so what we have done is we have the net effect is to provide a limited civil cause of action uh, where an individual civil rights have been violated by a police officer and the police officer did not have a good faith belief uh, that they were abiding by the law when they did it. So two prongs to the test, right? An officer has to violate somebody's civil rights and, but that in and of itself isn't enough, just because you violated some, somebody's civil rights. As long as that officer had a good faith belief that they were complying with the law when they did it, um, then that case can still be dismissed at the courthouse. It's only those cases where the officer violates somebody's civil rights without a good faith belief that they're complying with the law, that it actually can go to passed a motion to dismiss and to a jury. Even then, the officer is not personally liable. The municipality may be liable, but the officer does not face personal liability unless their conduct is willful, malicious, and wanton. Um, and that is existing federal law. What we have done away with or changed from federal law is, um, or I guess, let me step back. What we have done is actually go back to a version of qualified immunity that existed in federal law back in the 1960s. More recent um, Supreme Court decisions through the 1980s and the 1990s have made qualified immunity even a more draconian defense and have said, even when those other elements are met, um, unless the officer violated a clearly established um, uh, constitutional right, which means basically there's already a case on the books where somebody has done the same thing, the courthouse door is slammed in your face. So sorry for the constitutional law lecture, but um, it's, it's not as simple as it, it, some folks are making it out to be. It is a nuanced area of the law. And just as a follow up to that, you know, you, you talked a lot about the good faith belief. Um, I know there's a there's a phrase in there about objectively it being an objective uh, in, in some way. So how does that get decided or who decides that? And that 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 question's coming from Darren uh, Parker. 
That's actually, um, so that's on the motion to dismiss phase. So that's actually a, a judge's decision based on the record presented at the motion to dismiss phase. Thank you. Um, hey, Phil, could, could, I, could I just jump in and add one quick thing to that? Please. That, that what the Connecticut legislature has done is change the Connecticut law. But uh, plaintiffs have the option of suing in federal court where there's also a qualified immunity defense. And, uh, the, and, and if they do that, the Connecticut law doesn't really matter in those types of cases. But the reason I'm mentioning this is going back to what I said earlier, when the Congress comes in next year, depending on the election results, it seems pretty obvious that the, that the federal qualified immunity is going to be modified in some fashion. This is not, this is not a bill that Congress ever passed. This is, these are a series of United States Supreme Court decisions as it relates to bringing lawsuits in federal court. And so all of this is gonna be, it's, it's unbelievably complicated to explain to people. I'm not even sure I understand it hundred percent, but this will evolve over the next year or so for sure, uh, not just on the state level, but on the federal level. So don't forget, this, the Connecticut changes don't affect what happens in federal court. Okay, and can I jump in? And that's, and that's why we, we did what, what we did here. So uh, there was a call for the state to do something on the issue of qualified immunity, but that's a, that's a federal issue. And so we were looking for a way to make it happen here. So people, people said, well, you guys are um, strengthening qualified immunity. You're not eliminating qualified, all, all of these things. None of that was ever going, my kid is just having a blast. None of, none of that was ever going to happen. Um, and, and I do think that Mike is right, which is why anyone who thinks that uh, this bill is the end of, end of the line, at least for a while, is probably not paying attention to what's happening nationally because there will be implications uh, at the federal level, but there, those things will also have effects here in the state. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question. There was a question from from Jeff Schwartz that uh, that I wanted to turn to. But but Asti, do you want to ask Ann W's question real quick? Yeah. So given the lack of uniformity statewide in police training, development, and reforms, how can we work to create an entirely different culture throughout the state? As mentioned, we don't have a chief mellow in every city. Uh, Representative Staffram, do you want to take a stab at this one? Oh boy, I'm not sure anybody's going to want to <laughs> answer. But um, you know, I mean, look, if I had my if I had my way, this bill would have called for regionalization of our police forces. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, I think um, if we had larger police forces that were responsible for policing a larger swath of area, um, it would bring about more uniformity overall. Um, I, you know, I I saw not to get political here, but I saw a video from, um, you know, certain folks in, in a town that borders Bridgeport to our west, um, our, our favorite suburb of Fairfield today, um, where their police department or, or police union put something out endorsing certain candidates. And, you know, they called for the repeal of this section of the, this bill that bans consent searches. Um, and I pulled the racial profiling report from last year. Uh, in the town of Fairfield, black people are subject to four times as many consent searches as white people are. And it's a town that's predominantly white. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, and then if you look at where folks are charged with certain crimes, the number of infractions issued on the west side of Fairfield closest to the Westport border doubles those on the east side of Fairfield where folks are handed out misdemeanor offenses on the Bridgeport side of town. You know, it's, we've got these arbitrary lines and we police based on that. Um, and we've got more police per capita in certain towns than other towns. And it leads to absolute total non-uniformity. Now, getting off the soapbox for a second and back to what's what's real and what's practical um, is, you know, this bill, I think, at least starts the process of saying uniformity of training, uh, increasing the standards overall, um, trying to provide some implicit bias training, and getting back to the point of this entire bill, which is 
um, how black and brown communities are policed vis-a-vis -vis white communities in the state. Can I also respond to that? Um, and I, sure. I you know that time is, uh, is running short. And I go back to my earlier point. Well, first of all, I, I agree with Representative Stastrom. There are too many, uh, uh, there's 100 police departments in a small state, all with their own structure. It's not even cost effective. Um, and, uh, and then there's a question of what is the leadership in those communities. And, and uh, uh, I think we suffer for, in Connecticut from not having a county government system. But we have tried to do that and we have expanded our role with POST intentionally so over the last three or four years to make sure that first of all, all the core curriculum for every police recruit is the same, the same standards. Uh, that's developed by the POST Council. The annual training, uh, which is not just developed by the council, but there's also statutory requirements that every police officer has to have a certain amount of training in certain subject areas to maintain a certification and they get recertified every three years. But that's just the floor. And some agencies do a really good job of providing much more training than the minimums. And some just provide the minimums. But there is a, there is, um, um, you know, a, a, a mandated list of, of required courses and we do look at that and evaluate that on a regular basis. Thank you, Chief. Um, so we're, we're getting close to time, but I wanted to jump on one other issue uh, before, we, before we totally close out the, the Q&A for tonight. Um, you know, we, we've seen comments uh, and questions from Mark Douglas. We've seen uh, comments uh, from others in, in Barbara Katz as well. Um, you know, going to the decertification issue and, and the, you know, I think it was you, Chief, who said in the beginning that, you know, we can't continue to just fire police officers and, and that type of thing uh, and go out and hire new ones. And obviously there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, 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 you know, emotion and, and, and I think real, you know, concern about the flip side of that coin, which is, you know, allow, you know, having, having a potential culture out there or letting police, um, you know, off the hook, if, especially, you know, in their involvement with people of color. Um, and Barbara raises up the question of the idea that, um, you know, with respect to, to doctors and lawyers, you know, they don't have a, immunity for, for their actions. They have, uh, you know, they may have a malpractice insurance or something like that, um, you know, and they're held responsible for what they do. And I guess I would just like to hear from everybody about, you know, your thoughts on the decertification process, uh, how, you know, how police departments are going to you know, to, you know, work on that issue, uh, how the state's going to work on that issue, um, and what we're going to do to make sure that we have, uh, you know, well-trained police officers out there, um, you know, that, 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 you know, maybe we don't have to get into the decertification realm as much, but, so I just look for people's thoughts on, on that overall issue. Bill, if I could, uh, and again, I'll try to be quick. Um, what I was referring to is that we can't, we have to try to develop a better police officer and we have to develop better police officers that can make better decisions. However, there are certainly, without a doubt, some men and women that should not be police officers. There are even good men and women that have committed egregious acts that impeach their ability to testify in court and that have committed, even made just mistakes that no longer allow, render them suitable to be police officers. The decertification process has always been one in Connecticut. In fact, um, it was the post council uh, uh, to that uh, had requested of the Judiciary Committee to include language in the decertification process. Uh, we finalized that today. It's very robust. It's the most robust in the country. Um, it allows, based upon a finding by that law enforcement unit, to to uh, send certain there are certain qualifying offenses. Uh, where that officer is still uh, under, you know, provided with due process as per the state statute. And uh, it's heard by an arbitrator and decisions are made to permanently remove the license to be a police officer, which we call the certification. We went beyond the statute um, and we required four areas that are mandatory that have to be reported. We went beyond the statute and defined what we thought discriminatory conduct was, what we thought conduct undermines the public confidence. Uh, and, and so, I, I encourage you that document should be posted on the post website very soon. Uh, but this was in direct response to police chiefs that said, 
because you can look at these uh, departments and, and uh, in many departments, uh, you, you might be very surprised on how the level of accountability within those departments. But police chiefs told us early on that for the most egregious, and we're talking about some of the most egregious acts, that for these egregious acts, that they are not seeing the support at the labor board. Now they're normally supported, there's normally a finding, and they agree with the findings that the discipline, that the conduct occurred, but there seems to be a propens propensity at the board of mediation and arbitration to, uh, to reduce that discipline. When we fire a police officer to give that police officer the job back, or you have chiefs that are reluctant to, to take aggressive action because they're concerned that they're going to have a decision overturned. And what does that mean to the culture of the agency? So it was in direct response to those concerns by police chiefs that we on June 2nd voted, we being the council to ask the legislature, judiciary committee to, uh, to uh, um, put that in the, uh, in the police accountability. But I'm not saying they wouldn't have on their own, but uh, uh, I think that's something that uh, we're, we're, we're proud of that work. And, and, and that is not the most popular, that is also a very unpopular part of the bill, but it's something that is widely supported. And, and I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you, Chief. Go ahead, Representative. I, I just want to say Chief Mello is selling himself short. He deserves a lot of credit for pushing this. Um, it, it's a major, major reform. I, I Frankly, I think it's one of the most important pieces of the bill. Uh, is the ability to make it easier to get bad officers off the street, not just in one community, but back to my earlier point, if you know if you're if if you're if you shouldn't be on the police force in Milford, you shouldn't be on the police force in New Haven or Bridgeport either. Um, so it's not good enough just to fire an officer sometimes, and, and quite frankly, it's a little difficult to do that. So uh, Chief Mello deserves a ton of credit for um, for pushing this major major reform. Thank you. Senator Winfield, did you want to weigh in on, on this? Uh, I think Chief Mello most, mostly got it. I just want to say one thing about uh, what you just heard. Uh, despite the fact that uh, it's been indicated that we didn't talk to anybody, this is kind of the, the type of thing that can happen when conversations happen. You hear things, and, and I will say, we might have gotten something on decertification, but I don't think it would, would have looked like it it currently looks and, and 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 you take those ideas you bat them around after you've heard them you go back you have a conversation about it and some of that stuff gets put in the bill now whether people like it or not is a different question but that's the point there's a process by which those people who are now saying that they didn't get heard can be heard and you have to choose to participate what we want is to make policing better in the state of connecticut we're not out to, to harm anybody so I, I just think it's important to think about uh, what you're hearing and, and recognize that it means that there was an effort and there's an ongoing effort to to have these conversations. And thank you. And Professor Lawler, anything else to add to that? Sorry to unmute myself. I apologize. So uh, yeah, and, and I think that you're talking about the back end of the system. You're talking about disciplining current police officers. And, and I think it's it, extremely important, and I'm sure Chief Mello agrees with this, to going forward to recruit the kinds of people we want to be sworn police officers. And, you know, at my university, we spend a lot of time talking young people into going into a career in law enforcement, especially uh, young people of color, uh, because that is one of the best solutions to the problem, to have good people coming into the forces uh, early on. So, uh, and, and I think everyone who's participating in this meeting has contact with people in the community. And I think if you see uh, uh, well-intentioned people who are who might be thinking of this career to encourage them to not be discouraged by the debates they're seeing publicly, but to, to go into law enforcement because they're, they're the change we want them to be, right? I mean, they're the ones that are going to make a difference. So uh, focus on the front end. Hmm. Good point. Thank you so much. Um, there are a ton of great questions in the chat and, and you know, without us staying here uh, forever, we're not going to be able to, to deal with them. And I, you know, I want to really thank everybody uh, who has been with us. Uh, I would ask for you to stay with us a few more minutes. Uh, we're running just a little bit behind, uh, but there's so much to talk about with this bill. Um, and just thank everybody for, for being here and participating. Um, I want to tell you that, you know, the police accountability issue um, is not an isolated issue by itself. 
right? We, we know, we believe um, that there are systemic changes that are needed in multiple areas. Mm -hmm. We could talk all night, we could have a session just like this about how to talk about and deal with COVID in prison. We could sit here and have a session just like this about you know, making sure that people who are in pretrial detainment who haven't even been convicted of anything um, you know, are able to exercise their franchise to vote which is a timely topic. We could talk about the prison population. Um, and I'll recognize that, you know, Connecticut has, has um, you know, through, you know, through some, some direct effort, but also I think some, some you know, uh, unplanned for <laughs> eventualities around COVID, you know, the prison population actually is now, um, you know, within the sort of cut 50 uh, goal that, that's been out there for a while. And we're now at less than 50 percent, um, you know, of, of people in prison uh, versus the 2008 peak. But we still have a significant issue going on with mass incarceration. And that's going to remain a, a devastating, um, you know, impact on, uh, on, on people and communities and families uh, for a long time. And, and that's one of the reasons that we are still championing the Clean Slate Act which uh, for those who are unfamiliar is a bill that we've been proposing for the last couple of years um, that would automatically expunge the criminal record um, of, of certain people who were formerly incarcerated if uh, you know, lower level with, you know, who had lower level felonies uh, or misdemeanors if uh, they met certain conditions primarily being staying out of the criminal justice system uh, after completing their sentence for, for various periods of time. Uh, Michigan has passed a recent uh, law with respect to clean slate. Um, Pennsylvania passed it in, in, I think it was 2018, which inspired us to, uh, to start working on the issue. Um, and I would just, uh, I, 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 I think I'll turn it over to Asti uh, at this point, but, um, but that is something that remains important uh, in terms of, of what Connect is doing next. Yes, so Senator Winfield, we wanted to ask you, um, would you still be committed to leading the fight for Clean Slate with us again in 2021? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm committed until that gets done. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Representative Staffstrom, same question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and Chief Mello, um, we know we have not always agreed about all the details of Clean Slate, but we really do appreciate always having a very constructive um, relationship with you. And we just want to know, we'll be able to count on you to continue this relationship around these issues. Well, well certainly we can continue uh, to have the relationship and have the discussions. I do want to remind you that um, as, when I was the president of the Chief Association that we supported Clean Slate, not as far as uh, um, you, were, you had suggested, but uh, we did uh, support it uh, uh, up to a certain level. And so that, we agree with the, con well, I'm sorry, I'm not the rep anymore, but uh, I agree with the concept. Um, I applaud what you're trying to do. Um, and I think it is important that law enforcement does uh, have a seat at that table to talk about what may impact um, public safety. But uh, I, I appreciate your efforts and, uh, and, uh, and I agree with the, I, I agree with the concept. Thank you so much. And to everyone else on the call, um, so this is a community organizing group, meaning that we all have our individual power to move, get things moving and shifting in our community. So we actually have a call for you all too. Do you all want to be a part of pushing Clean Slate in Connecticut uh, with Connect in the fall and in 2021 to get it passed? And so in the chat, Kristen put a form there. You can sign up to join to be a part of this movement to get Clean Slate passed in the state of Connecticut. We really appreciate you all to be a part of that. Um, and also, we talked about it uh, a lot already here. Pretty much, uh, we know that this is we're in voting season right now, and we do have to get out the vote. Uh, Connect and Metro IF, uh, we do have a, a get out the vote team in work, essentially in places that are purple states or uh, battle states, uh, such as. Um, 
such as North Carolina, that we're trying to make sure we have to vote there to encourage people just to get and register, make sure they have the polls or get their absentee ballots. So if you want to be a part of that work, please let us know. I can plug you into that and make sure you're also going to vote in the state of Connecticut as well, as far as uh, getting your absentee ballot or actually being in the polls on November 3rd, uh, rain, sleet, or snow. Um, and so we do just want to thank all of our guests and that lovely baby uh, for being here tonight. Um, and we really appreciate your thoughtful um, uh, comments and the fact that you spend time with us this evening. And we just want to make sure we, uh, if y'all have anything else to say, so I'm going to start with Chief Mello. Any final thoughts? I don't. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and to have this discussion. And, and uh, I look forward to uh, many more. Thank you. Uh, Representative Staffstrom, any final thoughts? Uh, no, just thanks. Thanks for uh, doing this, constructing it. Um, in addition to helping in those battleground states, I would say there are, as every year, there's 10 or 20 legislative races that will make the difference between, um, you know, how big a margin or control there is for either party in the Connecticut General Assembly. So um, don't be afraid to get in, involved in those matters, those races too, because uh, there's a whole number of house races that'll be decided by less than 100 votes. And so making phone calls, donating uh, 50 bucks, uh, that kind of stuff uh, really does matter in those house races as well. So uh, don't be afraid to reach out if you, you need help and how to get involved. Senator Winfield, any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank you all for, for holding this, and uh, I just want to go ahead and thank you in advance for the work you're going to do on that issue we just talked about, Clean Slate, um, because I know you're going to be in the fight and be important to uh, us getting that done, um, and we'll, we'll see you after the election. And Professor Lawler, any last thoughts from you? Are you still here? I can't see you. I am. I, I was muted there for a second. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you. I mean, it, the, more discussions like this with all the stakeholders involved are exactly what we need to move forward. And, and I thank you for doing it. I know Connect has a long history of doing it. And earlier you mentioned your involvement in the East Haven situation, my hometown, and that uh, had a happy ending. You know, the, the reforms were adopted, crime went down, uh, confidence in my old community in the local police went way up. And uh, Everybody was a winner. So I think that's the goal here. And, uh, and let's see how things play out. Well, I want to thank all of you as well. Chief Mello, Professor Lawler, um, uh, you, know, you guys have, have been leaders. And I want to thank the incredible uh, leadership that, that we are seeing um, from uh, Senator Winfield and from Representative Stastrom. You've been fantastic allies with Connect, and, and we very much appreciate all of that. I also want to thank uh, my, my co-chair tonight, uh, my co-chair always, uh, Dr. Asti Jackson. Um, uh, very pleased to, to be with you tonight and the whole team uh, behind the scenes uh, from uh, Matt McDermott and, and Kristen Estabrook, Kirk uh, Wesley and, and Rabbi Schultz. Um, and I want to thank again our entire audience uh, as well for joining us tonight. Um, and with that, I would turn us to our, to our closing prayer uh, for just a moment. Reverend uh, Anthony Bennett. All right, you unmuted me. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I want to do uh, what I'm calling a creative benediction, closing prayer tonight. Um, those of you who've been, and I want to uh, share, as many people have shared, this is a very fruitful discussion, and I know we're going to continue this discussion, and my hat's off, and thanks to all who coordinated it. Many of you know that I um, began and end a lot of our public sessions with the word namaste. Namaste, which means the divinity in me salutes the divinity in you. Like many of you, I've gone from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting today. Uh, as we say, I'm all Zoomed out. And in that process, um, I did not change what I had on today. If you can see it, it is a picture, a t-shirt of the sign uh, worn by the sanitation workers in 1968. They struck. And I wore this 
And as I'm thinking about this, I said, well, I wanted to change. But I said, no, uh, I've talked with Matt. I said, I wanted to keep this shirt, this T-shirt on um, because it is a reminder of the absurdity that in today's culture, we would say that it was absurd. Of course, these are black men. And of course, they deserve uh, equal pay or they deserve a responsible pay. But in real time, because of the mores of the culture and the assumptions and the cognitive dissonance in the community, um, they literally had to wear signs and that said, I am a man. Their namaste was denied. It, we can affirm the divinity, but they wore the signs to affirm their humanity. Similar to what we um, witnessed this summer, the Black Lives Matter signs, the Black Lives Matters, and often the response has been, well, all lives matter. To a person saying that to a person that is African American, you are neutralizing the history and the present reality of discrimination for which this police accountability bill uh, was drafted. It is my prayer that as we say namaste, I salute the divinity. It is my prayer that we might also salute the humanity, the humanity of the men and women I must serve such that the men and women who serve our broader communities have a great stewardship to not just look at our divinity, but also look and protect and serve our humanity. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Bennett. Uh, your words are, they're always inspiring. I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Um, I'm going to offer this one last thing tonight. Um, I, I really do want the audience to join us. Uh, we're going to unmute you all. We thank you all again for joining us tonight. And I just want you to give a round of applause again, both for all of our speakers tonight and for yourselves uh, for being here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Thank you so much. Everyone Namaste. be blessed. You yes, indeed. Thank you. And you as well. Thank you all so much. And Namaste. We wish you all a good night, a safe night, and we will see you again. Thank you. Uh, good night. Good night.